What's been your evolution of local versus remote? If you're going to have a distributed team, you need to like be super, super clear on context setting, on goal setting, on directions. At every stage, you need a slightly different thing. But in particular, a thing that you get from a distributed team is that you are forced to write things down. Your culture and knowledge is as good as the last person you hired. If you have a distributed company that has the same processes as a bad open source project, you're going to have the outcome of a bad open source project. Hi, I'm Paul Berger, founder of Dark. I'm Edith Harba, CEO and co-founder at LaunchDarkly. And you're listening to To Be Continuous, a podcast about continuous delivery and software development. You can get in touch with us anytime at our Twitter handle, at ContinuousCast. The show is brought to you by Heavybit. To learn more, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out their library, home to great educational talks from other developer company founders and industry leaders. So, Edie, LaunchDarkly is all local? We're transitioning right now. Okay. How about Dark? Uh, Dark is all local, but we are, are we eight people or nine people? Well, interesting. So you've done, every time I ask you, it's a different answer. You've done five startups now? It's four, four startups. All right. Uh, I, I'm not counting a couple of things, but like four, <laughs> four that incorporated, All right. let's say. So what's been your evolution of, of local versus remote? So I'm not going to count any of the earlier ones. Circle was, was the first one that really counted, and that was um, not so much remote as distributed. So we didn't have another office. We had the Circle office, and frequently the Circle office was like, I, I think it's been about half the company has been at headquarters and half the company has been has been remote. Now the company is like I don't know, 230 people or something like that. It's huge. And the engineering team in particular is extremely distributed. Tell me about why you did that with Circle and why you're not doing that with Dark. So with Circle, we knew what we were building. Mm. Uh, like... In 2012, it was very clear that there was a CI-shaped hole in the market, and we knew what to put into that hole. Like a circular. Yeah, the, it, was a, it was a circular sort of hole. There was a thing. peg. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was a circle-shaped peg that you could. Right, right, and, and many people were, were trying to were trying to fill it with, with other shaped pegs, but but circle was the one that fit the market the best. And with dark, we're building. Uh, a thing that we don't really understand. Mm. So there's a, an exploration. There's like figuring out. It's like very like high bandwidth communication is required for for a lot of things, and we're we're not planning on staying like that forever. Uh, in fact, I imagine that that when we raise our next round, that we will probably shift partially because it's so hard to to hire. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, not about dark and circle because I don't know them so well, but about our own company. Mm-hmm. About launch darkly that um, at the beginning there was a lot of discovery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it really helped us that we were all at Heavybit. Mm-hmm. That you were just all in the same room, or specifically at Heavybit. Both. I mean, I remember uh, John, my co-founder, and I, the CTO, would go out to some sort of. I don't even want to call them customers because they weren't paying us. But yeah. We would go out to some sort of meeting and. We'd hear people's problems. We would come back, mm-hmm. and this is the heavy bit part. We would all get lunch with our engineers. Mm-hmm. And when I say all get lunch, I mean we had two engineers. The four of us would go get lunch. It yeah, wasn't yeah. super fancy, and we would talk about how the meeting had gone. Mm-hmm. And I had come from a world before at big enterprise companies where you would write these elaborate PRDs, mm-hmm. product requirements. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever been in a big company where. No. That sounds like hell. Yeah. When I was a product manager at a big enterprise company, you would write like a 40 page spec doc that nobody would ever read. Mm -hmm. And then you would have to explain, like, this is why I care about this. And the engineers would. But the spec is what you have to do. Like, I feel the the value of that meeting is is like, here are the learnings. Yeah. But you would try to synthesize a month of of meetings Mm -hmm. into one spec. Yeah. Versus in the early days, like, we would just go to a meeting, we would come back and we're like, here's what people are thinking about. Mm hmm. At Circle, when we would have those meetings, we would frequently, but I, I think we probably only did this in about half the cases. But we would like write up what happened and just like emailed it to the company. So it's like we we met this person; they had these interesting insights, X, Y, and Z, and it w- wouldn't have any necessarily any answers, just like you know, good questions to to like be thinking about. Yeah, and that's definitely what we do now that we're bigger. Mm-hmm. But I think a huge strength of us looking back is that we could do it in real time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like John and I would be kind of heatedly discussing, like, mm-hmm. what do they mean by this? What do they mean by this? Our engineers are like, hey, what do they mean by this? Mm-hmm. And there wasn't an intermediate step of let me wait to have 
you know, 40 minutes to put together a grammatical mm-hmm. paper. We are, we are co-located, but we also have like a little more process than that, which is something different than we did at Circle, where we're like extremely low process. And so we have like sessions where we are where we discuss customer feedback and like we write down customer feedback and then have a have a place that that we sit down and you know how is this going to turn into product requirements should we even do this sort of thing like where does it go on the roadmap? Oh, we of course did that when we got bigger. It's just at yeah. the very very early stage when we we're under ten. Yeah, we didn't really do that. I'm finding a lot of value from doing it even at this small size. And you know, as someone who is like extremely against process. Now that there is good process, and, and this is what you get from having a PM as a co-founder, so I'm sure John is pretty blessed with the same thing. That like you end up with process that actually works, and so the the whole kind of like anti-process thing that was going around in the you know 2012s, 13s, 14s. I mean, I, th- I think it's terrible, but I hadn't personally seen a better thing to do. And now that I have, it's like it's wonderful. Paul, I've been continuously biting my tongue for the last three minutes. Uh huh. To not say like I told you so. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure you did. Probably multiple times. And I don't listen to old episodes, but but presumably many an episode has been like, "Well, oh, Paul, did you ever think about having a process?" <laughs> well, no. What I said in the past is you always have a process. Mm-hmm. It might just not be a good process or when you right, acknowledge. Right. Yeah. Like if your process is you don't write anything down and the engineers build whatever they feel like building, mm-hmm. that's still a process. Yes, that that was our explicit process for a time at Circle. And I think actually that that's one that that doesn't play that well with a distributed team. Oh no, it's awful because yeah. like you have this huge time lag. You have a perhaps mm-hmm. perhaps a culture barrier where somebody in a, uh, doesn't want to question. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of expectation that you would figure out what was valuable to work on, and in a distributed team, that's like that's terrible. In a co-located team, it, it would probably have been much better, but not still not good. Yeah, I mean, I think that process of we didn't write much down, we did write stuff down, worked till about eight, and then we had to transition mm-hmm. to more process. Yeah, so we, we, we write specs for everything now. Uh, and they're not like particularly long specs, they're often just like a couple of paragraphs being like this. Oh, is, yeah, we, we would write paragraphs, but yeah, we wouldn't write, like, yeah. we wouldn't write volumes. I guess to go back for a second, I don't want to say that we didn't have specs, they were just, I think the thing we did not have to do was defend our rationales behind them. You mean as founders or as early employees? Like it was was the same for everyone, or was that just a founder thing? I'm not going to name a name, but there's a company you and I both know very well that's mm-hmm. based in Ireland. They still haven't built SSO. Uh, a company that we both know that is based in Ireland. Can't imagine what that is. No, me neither. Because oh. they're like, well, why would we build this? Nobody needs it. Mm-hmm. And anybody who spent a lot of time out in the field is like, every big company needs mm-hmm. SSO. Mm-hmm. So, like the the thing I mean about uh, high bandwidth is. When it came to like, why do we, why does launch directly need to be able to SSO? Why is security important? Why mm-hmm. are we building this audit log feature, which might sound extremely boring? Our engineers are right there with us because mm-hmm. they're like, yeah, we've heard you come back from this meeting and you talked mm-hmm. about why the customer wants this. Mm-hmm. We get it. Right. Fundamentally, you want to get everyone at your company on the same page. Yeah. And there are, I would say, different challenges at different sizes. I would say it's not absolute that the like absolute one is better or, or no or, no no. But in particular, a thing that you get from a distributed team is that you are forced to write things down. Yeah. And there's a lot of like benefits from that. It's not you know the people who find out about it aren't just the people who are like you know sit nearest you or, or are in the right meetings. Like everyone in the company gets aligned on the same page. There's a lot of forcing functions around things like accessibility. Things that you have to do if if you're distributed because there's so many people who aren't in the company. Whereas typically you would get someone who's a um, sort of you know second class citizen if they're the only remote person at the company. Paul, you're just saying everything I would say, and I'm just what I'm, uh, another podcast where we completely agree with each other. No, four years I'm ago, <laughs> four years ago, you would have said like, "Hey, everybody should just get it." And what, you think I would have said that? I could replay that episode for you. <sighs> I would rather not. That's. <laughs> <laughs> Strongly trying to forget all of that. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, I, I totally agree. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that at every stage, you need a slightly different thing. Like mm-hmm. up until we were eight people, we had a daily stand up with the entire company. Mm-hmm. And that was extremely valuable. Yeah. And I still remember our last stand up when we were about 15 people. We were like, okay, mm-hmm. this is the end of daily stand ups with everybody. Oh. And now we have to like start doing different group meetings yeah. and then we'll write down our group statuses. Mm hmm. 
Yeah, we're still doing the daily stand up, and it's kind of getting to the size where one thing we do actually that's really good is, is we have this contact sharing meeting on Thursdays. And that's basically if you're newer than someone else, which means everyone, you can ask for a particular document to be like discussed, mm. like from, from the past. Why did we do this this way? Yeah. And it could be like part of the code base, it could be product spec, it could be just like, you know, I don't understand this concept. And then we talk about the concept and what we're especially finding now that we have now that we have marketing and, and other folks that they gain a huge amount from from this, much, much more than than the engineers who who gain some. I think it's also really valuable, and this is what I try to push our team towards is to don't venerate the past. Mm-hmm. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Like we might have done this way mm-hmm. two years ago. Two years is a long time. Yeah. And that, that's actually one of the great things about the context sharing because like we can share like, you know, back then we thought this and that was that was wrong. Yeah. That's it was a terrible idea and we we regret it entirely. I try to avoid judgment. Like I try to say, hey, this was something we tried two years ago. Mm-hmm. Maybe this was a good idea two years ago. It didn't work. Mm-hmm. Like I'll, I'll give an example. Our first meetups, we got very low attendance. They didn't work mm-hmm. at all. When we started to get a bigger name and a bigger brand, our meetups are great now. Oh, it's just the size. Yeah. Yeah. There's just stuff that comes with size that works. Mm-hmm. But you probably got something out of the small ones, like uh, some evangelists, some people who like really liked you. Uh, we got a lot of pizza that nobody ate. All right. I mean, the worst was we we accidentally scheduled it during Salesforce, mm-hmm. Dreamforce, and a Warriors season final, mm-hmm. and we got two people who showed up. Oh, that's. It would be better that no one showed up. Yeah, almost. I mean, no one shows up. You can go home. <laughs> we have one person who I knew through our accelerator, who's mm-hmm. basically come to every one of our meetups. Oh, that's cute. Yeah, but like, if, if a lesson from that is like never do a meetup. Mm-hmm. Right, right. It's not the lesson at all. Yeah. The lesson is like, hey, that didn't work. Let's put this on pause for a little bit and then try it again. So you moved to Oakland at some point. Yes, you came to our moving in party. I, I, I remember, um, <laughs> but the, the people listening to the podcast did uh, not come to your moving in party. So I'm setting up context for for the discussion that ensues. Oh, thanks, Paul. I just thought you were trying to cover up the my, my, my terrible memory. <laughs> but you did remember to wear your lunch darkly shirt. Of course, I always remember that. So you were in heavy bit, and then you moved to Oakland. Yeah. So um, what size? Well, we were four people when we moved in because I remember we literally could. Pick up everything, pack in the hatchback of our engineer's car, and drive mm-hmm. it the three blocks. Uh, this was when you moved into Heavy Bit. Yeah, because we were up at Market three blocks away, mm. and so we put all our monitors in. Where is that runway? We had gotten co-working space at the Yammer office. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so, and I remember because I was like, "This is the easiest move we're ever going to do." So you were here till I seem to recall like eighteen, sixteen, twenty, somewhere um, around there. After we closed our A, we moved to Oakland, and that was spring of 2016. Mm -hmm. And was that for office space, or for hiring, or for like standard living? Like, what was the what was the purpose of moving to Oakland? We'd always wanted to be in Oakland. Mm -hmm. Like, we'd actually started the company in Oakland. Uh, So John and I, John, my Mm co-founder, had started at a co-working space in Oakland, Mm -hmm. and then we got into an accelerator based out of Yammer, Mm -hmm. and then we got into Heavybit. But whenever we hired somebody new, mm-hmm. we always said, "Well, we're going to move to Oakland." Oh, you told them from the start. Yeah, gotcha. So there, there was no like pushback when you finally decided to move. And the only pushback was uh, people kept wanting us to move, and I said, "Until we get our A, we don't, we don't have the money yeah, to move." Yeah. And then, oh, so people wanted to move far sooner. Oh, they'd already gotten apartments over in Oakland. Right. Okay. They yeah. were ready. Yeah. And then, like the day the A closed, they're like, "Great, it's time to go." <laughs> uh, so, have you found it easier to hire in Oakland? I think so. I don't know if there's another variable, which is that you know we're a more successful company. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you're trying to hire when you're eight people and just getting off the ground, versus mm-hmm. you know we have 800 customers worldwide. We've raised 77 million dollars. How, how many customers? 800 worldwide. 800 customers. Wow. 77 million dollars in venture funding. Mm-hmm. That's very different than we were sitting here with yeah, yeah, yeah. two million in venture funding and scraping to get a customer. I mean, month. The, we should probably pause and recognize those are. Fucking crazy numbers. Which like, one? I mean, both of them actually. Just the, the, like two million dollars is so much money, and then seventy-seven million isn't it? Just an absolute flabbergasting amount of money. <laughs> that literally happened. I was on a sales call this morning, mm-hmm. which is a funny side story. But uh, so I was selling to the CTO, and I'm 
going through her brag slides. Mm-hmm. He's like, 77 million. And then you hear the voice on the phone, and he's like, yeah, 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 things are different now. <laughs> what did that mean? I think he was just flabbergasted mm-hmm. that we had raised 77 million for feature management. And did you explain to them that you had 800 customers worldwide and that they, they paid you a phenomenal amount of money for, for the thing? and that, that They pay us an intrinsic value based, mm-hmm, yeah. much like Circle, who is a... Uh, would you describe the, its intrinsic value as a, as a value minus or a cost plus? Uh, I'm lost in your logic now. Uh, <laughs> so one, one of the reasons that, that everyone moves to... Oakland and other places is that they can't afford to hire in San Francisco or Palo Alto or wherever it is that they are anymore. So let me loop back to the sales meeting for a second. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it was really funny because it was a sales meeting in San Francisco, mm-hmm. and like we made a big push to show up in person because it was a really important customer mm-hmm. that we're trying to. Do you still live in San Francisco? I used to live in San Francisco. Uh, my co-founder lives in Oakland. It's a customer we have some usage at. We're trying to get more, so it was a mm-hmm. meeting with their CTO. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, you show up in person for it mm, if it's yep. a CTO. So it was myself, my co-founder John, our salesperson, mm-hmm. like we get there bright and early. And we're sitting in the conference room and everybody's remote. Everyone. Everyone else on the meeting. Wow. I've done this. I've gone to like a meeting at Google and it's like, why did I come here? We could have <laughs> Well, I came in person. What was the point of this? Oh well, yeah, like we'd all like, like we'd shown up. Like yeah. we'd put on like our our nice clothes. Yeah, we're like yeah, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna show the customer they're important, and we walk right. in. And you, but you could have been sitting at home in your like pajama bottoms, <laughs> like you know, put put on a shirt and makeup, and like the rest doesn't matter. <laughs> you put on your makeup. I put on my makeup. Yeah, yeah. before call. It's. It, I mean, it depends on the lighting, of course. But <laughs> it depends if I have time to set up the lighting before the call or not. And yeah, but it was so. It rem- really reminded me. Have you seen um? There's this movie from the '80s with Val Kilmer. Is it Top Secret? It's the one where he's a student at a ripoff of Caltech. No, that's not the one. Everybody wants to sleep in, so they just go and they set up. This is from the '80s. They set mm-hmm. up a um a tape player to record the the lecture. Mm-hmm. So like there's this wall of tape recorders in the lecture hall, mm-hmm. and then the end of it is that the professor also sets up his. <laughs> <laughs> so the finish of the story is I literally thought we'd rush all the way to the support yeah. customers thing to present in person. I mean that's a real power move, not showing up and like it being remote. Was it like someone showed you to a conference room? Somebody showed us to a conference room. Got you some water. Got us and some maybe, water. Maybe a snack. And like we set up, and it's a customer we're trying to sell to. Yeah, so like, yeah, yeah. And then there's people on the phone, and we're like, okay, there's somebody. Like they were legitimately remote. There was somebody yeah, in Ohio. Yeah, yeah. There was somebody in India. But the CTO was also remote. No, he's in San Francisco. Oh, was he there? No. Oh, he didn't show. It turned out he'd gone to the wrong building. And so he dialed in. No, he showed up about six minutes late, being like, "I'm so sorry." Ah, oh, that could be much worse. Like, I'm so sorry. There's multiple buildings. Right, right, right. But it was hilarious because was, I was just literally thinking, like, why don't we dial in? Well, anyway, so I mean, that's part of the power of local versus remote. It's just to show that you can show up and that you care, mm-hmm. and you're yeah, you get a lot from body language. I mean, I, I think one of the things about Circle being in San Francisco was that we were the CI company that was in San Francisco, and. You know, there was a there was a CI company in Amsterdam and in Berlin and uh, there was one in Australia and like there's there's a bunch of them everywhere, and we're the ones that people have personally met because we're at all the meetups and we we know the people and we meet random people and so on. And you'd be at a party and you'd just be like talking to someone and they're like, "Oh, you do CI, whatever." You sound uh, like real fun at parties, Paul. I definitely go to parties and talk about work all the time. It's like, let me tell you about CI. It's like, well, no. I got uninvited from all the other parties. So, um, so like, I think being in San Francisco, or at least like San Francisco adjacent Oakland, for Dev Tools is like this very important thing. Yeah, I didn't realize it. And then, um, like, we sold to Circle because mm-hmm. I started to know you through Heavybit. Yep. And that didn't count for anything. And then you made us go talk to all your engineers. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think by the time we were doing it, I, I just wasn't I wasn't doing anything. That's our call. But we could go into the office and talk to Jim mm-hmm. and your yeah. and uh, Zuber, the CTO. Yeah. And I was like, why did we have to go do that? They could have looked at the website. It's like, well, you have to show up. Yeah, yeah. You just you make the connection and then you you manage to convince them because like a lot of the time it seems off feature flags. Like we could build that ourselves and 
And we could use one of the open source things, and like we or we could kind of try it out, and you know maybe maybe get to it eventually. It's somewhere in the roadmap. But when you show up in person, like someone is like, oh yeah, no, actually that sounds like it could solve our problems, and you get to sell. So for dark, when do you think you start to go remote? So we have transitioned a little bit from like the original company was like figure out what we're building. Yep. We have figured out what we're building. Yep. We are now in the path of going to launch and, and going to like searching for product market fit. Strange Loop. We are having a launch party at Strange Loop. You should come. What's uh, the date? September thirteenth. Wow. On the evening of the conference. It must and be pretty exciting. Yeah, and you can sign up at darklang.com slash launch. Well, what stage do you think you'll start to hire a distributor remote? Uh, after the next round. I mean, already it's extremely challenging to to hire in San Francisco. Everyone that we, everyone that we talk to is like, you know talking to like fifteen other companies, and there, there's a lot of competition here. There's a lot of companies here, and it's not that that isn't true in other places, but there's a lot more people that that you can hire, and a lot more people who have the expertise that you're looking for. I think Oakland is a an advantage for us. Mm-hmm. Some of our managers come out of Atlassian because of my co-founder's connection. Mm-hmm. And they say it is easier to hire at Launch Darkly in Oakland yeah. than at last seen in SF. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. Why, why do you think so? SF is saturated. Like yeah. if you're if you're in a if you're in a high demand place, then a higher supply isn't all that useful because the demand is so high. But people want to have low commutes. Yeah. Commutes affect people's happiness. Uh, how uh, how much they enjoy working at a company. If you have an hour long commute for like a shit day versus a twenty minute commute for a shit day. You know, like that's going to be materially different. And if you have a wonderful day and then you have an hour long commute at home, you're still going to be like, oh, fuck. Oh my gosh. Oh. That just adds up. Yeah. And like some people, some people don't mind the commute. Some people are like built in a, some sort of different way that, that makes them okay with the commute. But even in that case, like people with long commutes would rather, oh, maybe I can work from home a couple of days a week. And when you're working from home, there's a material difference between. You know, it was okay for me to occasionally work, but I had to miss the meeting. And you know, I have a, an experience that is like ninety-eight percent equivalent. I do think it's possible to live too close to work. No, how how close would be too close? Well, like for example, if you had a house office. Oh, office houses are great. Oh yeah. I would say the ideal startup experience is is having your office in your living room. What do What do you like about it? The hypothetical you, of course. The hypothetical me, yes. This this was definitely not our situation until recently. If you're in the very early stages and you're in the stages where you where you work a lot, then you have like the exact same experience. Uh, no matter whether it's midnight or during the day, you have all your stuff. You have you have the same environment, same whiteboards. Working from an office house is fucking ideal. Love it. <laughs> oh. Sadly, we had to give up our office house because we hired too many people. Hmm. And then we went to Heavy Bit, and then we just got our own office uh, near uh, near your house, actually, but near the Bose Triangle. Yeah, I've heard about it. Oh, you haven't seen it yet. You should you should come by and see our our office house. Was there an office warming? There should have been an office warming. We did not have an office warming. It must be very cold. You know, it actually, we we have air conditioning, and San Francisco has been insane recently, so it's been freezing. So you said something interesting before about the transition between everything being. Spoken versus written down. Because mm-hmm. I think we are at the same phase because we crossed 100 employees. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely at the phase when I'm like, okay, don't assume that people know this is the way it works. Well, I, I think that the corollary to writing it down is that you have to organize it. Yeah. And one of the things I curse at the moment is, is Google Docs because your entry point to your documents is like this directory structure. Oh, it's awful. It's awful. And the searches for, for yeah. Google is awful. Yeah. And with other things, uh, I, don't, I don't know which ones because we use Google Docs, unfortunately. You can organize a hierarchy. You start in this page, and this page tells you all the places to go, and you can customize it, and you can have the other things like still sitting there but not really being relevant, whatever. And that ability to like organize people's experience around how they consume the documents that matter to your company is huge for, especially for new people who are coming in. Yeah, I mean, um, I have a, a theory that your culture and knowledge is as good as the last person you hired. Not sure if I agree with your theory, but carry on. Uh, that they don't know anything about your culture, they don't know anything about your knowledge, so they're at this point the strongest and weakest link. Why are they the strongest? Because they are going to convey stuff to the next person you hire. Mm, okay. So you're saying that if you don't manage to have a good context setting for the current 
for the newest hire. I mean, that's why people have like extensive boot camps. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you have a, a boot camp for new hires? We don't call it boot camp. We definitely have onboarding. Mm-hmm. I think boot camp has a lot of overhead as a word. Mm-hmm. Do you have a planned experience with some sort of coach? We have 30, 60, 90 plans. Okay. So this is a, a holdover from stuff I liked when I was a new hire. Yeah, we, we, we did 30, 60, 90 as well. Back when I was um, looking for jobs, I would ask my, man, my new manager mm-hmm. for 30, 60, 90 before I accepted the job. Hmm. And they would be surprised sometimes. Right, because people usually don't like to be managed. Oh, I, I wanted my objectives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't think, think of it as like being managed managed. I'm mm-hmm. like, hey, what am I going to do? Because I don't want to give up my current good job and go there unless I know what I'm getting into. Right. And if, so, you, if you don't know what I'm going to do in the first 90 days, like I don't, I don't want to just show up and flail around. Is that still each person is having an individual learning experience within their team? Or is there a... Like is is there a place that all the new hires go to acclimatize? We have some stuff that's across all functions. Mm-hmm. We've definitely started to specialize based on different roles, mm-hmm. like a thirty sixty ninety for a developer. I don't mean a thirty. I, I I'm trying to get back to the boot camp. Do you have something that is like roughly boot camp like a program for new hires? Yeah. Okay. But beyond that, like what we expect you to do is individual by function. How about you? When you're still at the stage where you're hiring one person a quarter, do you have how do, you, how do you onboard? Yeah, so we are, I think we're hiring a little bit faster than one person a quarter, but we're r- roughly in that area. And it's very much a custom plans per person. The context sharing thing really helps. Like it was originally started as an engineering thing. We've realized that it has as much possibly more value for, for non engineers. Yeah. Other than that, we do 30, 60, 90. We set up one on ones. There's a bunch of, bunch of things we do to like, Onboard people, but I would say that we we definitely don't have any sort of like program or, or that sort of thing. With engineers, we do two weeks of pairing at the start. Mm. Probably you spend five days paired with two people. We might be might be tweaking that, but it might be like you know four days with three people or something like that, and sort of like get you acclimatized to the code base. We 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 use an, an unusual language, so we use a camel for both the front end and the back end. So mm. that that's a little bit weird for people. And so we try to get people through projects where where they get to experience a large part of the code base and, and get to like understand how it all works. Paul, this this all warms my heart. That we don't just like give people a desk and be like, here's a here's a thing, go go figure out how to build it and then build it. Or worse yet, you know, the famous like you give somebody a parts of a desk and say <laughs> Well that was what Amazon was famous for is making everybody assemble their desk. Oh right. Oh god. So we actually have a really good technical onboarding experience. Like you get your laptop and installing the dark software it takes about an hour. Yeah. And it's an automated script and it just runs. Yeah. I mean it's a huge thing for us. We want to make people feel productive and happy as soon as mm-hmm. possible. At at Circle we we always tried to have people commit code on their first day. I think that that can be a lot to ask. Just simply, sometimes you you know there isn't a task available that that is going to be committable in you know five minutes of coding, but that like I, I find that ideal if if possible. Yeah, I think there was an anti pattern about twenty years ago of, and here's the exact anti pattern: let's hire a lot of really smart people mm-hmm. and have them figure it out. Oh my god! So, no, that that was like a real it, management. No, it was it was, it was, it was yeah. like, hey, we'll hire these bright grads out of. Yeah. Wherever and they'll figure out what the business is doing, what our core values are, and what customers mm-hmm. want on our and like it's like no, you hire a bunch of really bright people and it's mm-hmm. Lord of the Flies. Right. We had this at Mozilla. Like it was a very much a sink or swim culture. And I remember wh- when I was there, we, we got a new manager and the manager's like, We should try a meeting. For this was was for the JavaScript team. And I'm like, fucking great. Like a meeting. <laughs> we can understand what everyone is working on. We can get like context. But the thing is that most people in that team had been there like four or five years. They knew exactly what everyone was working on because they had so much context over the code base and the and they, they reviewed everyone's code and so on. And so they had one meeting and everyone's like, Yeah, we don't want this meeting. And I'm like, I'm completely fucked. Mm, as uh, the new hire? Uh, I wasn't even the new hire at that point, but I hadn't I hadn't like, you know, figured out large parts of things. Yeah, uh, and like Mozilla was like very much sink or swim. The problem is that then, the problem for me was that I like picked way too many projects, and then they were kind of all over the place, and then they they didn't. But like with little guidance, and my my, my manager had thirty five direct reports. Thirty five. Thirty five. Thirty five. That is the number that I said. 
How do you even physically do that? He, he also had like some IC work. 35 direct reports? Uh-huh. I mean, yeah. That, that's like a goldfish. Yes. So, <laughs> like, so like, like, like you don't even know where they all like they're like in this other thing getting eaten by a shark. I think I've said this before on on this podcast that uh, I feel that we all kind of got fucked by open source. That like there was this idea that you just kind of show up with a pull request and like that's how the software is like designed and built. And I think a lot of open source things have, have sort of internalized that that thing of just like you know the a- anyone shows up and if you're employed there you know you're just showing up forty hours a week with. Things that you figured out to do yourself, uh, but I mean that was ten years ago. I'm sure they've they've figured some of that stuff out by now. Yeah, fingers crossed. I mean that just sounds awful. Not all open source, but just the idea that everybody can figure out everything without any context. Right, right, right. I mean, if you look at at open source projects, the you know vast vast majority of them provide no context to to their potential contributors, and you know people. Come up with these drive-by PRs that are absolutely not not useful, and it's very few like really well-run open-source projects that that yeah do well at providing that context. I mean, the knock against A/B testing used to be that it meant throwing spaghetti at the wall. Mm-hmm. This yeah. sounds worse. Um, this sounds like yeah, throwing random foodstuffs in a wind tunnel. I mean, at least when you're when you're throwing spaghetti against the wall, there's a there's a wow. well-defined uh, success criteria. Right for for your A/B tests, it's like I know it makes us more money or less or conversions or whatever. The problem with, with this sort of thing with the you know sink or swim or like ha- however however you think of it, everyone figuring out their own their own success criteria is that everyone's on a different page. They're not on the same page. They're right. like in different universes. Mm-hmm. And there's like, the, like, like am I improving performance? Am I improving usability? Am I yeah. improving the API? Like mm-hmm. like what am I even doing? I, I released uh, an open source project recently, and one of the things that I really wanted to do before shipping it was like giving a rough roadmap for how I wanted, like what what are the goals of this, what is success criteria, what is not done, and you know how can you contribute to this in a way that is useful and meaningful. And as a result, every every contribution I made was meaningful and helpful. Or yeah. so every every contribution that anyone made was was actually like aligned with these objectives because we told them how. Well, because otherwise, like every check-in, it's like um, you could be doing this really neat thing in the UI that brings down performance by ten mm-hmm. percent. Yeah, but it's really neat. And it could be that performance is so great that mm-hmm. it's okay. Yeah. Or it could be like performance is a paramount thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be like you're doing something really cool that increases concurrency but mm-hmm. destroys the UI. Like, yep, yep. you just you're just sending people out to mm-hmm. just. It's like the random walk of all random walks. Yep. That sounds really frustrating to come to work every day too. Mm-hmm. So we've been talking about open source, and like obviously, open source is this great distributed project, right? It, it's kind of like having a distributed company, and it should be clear that if you have a distributed company that has the same processes as a bad open source project, you're going to have the outcome of a bad open source project. What, what do you think are the same outcomes? I mean, the negative outcomes are just it's going in a bunch of different directions. No one's work gets merged. People kill work at the last minute uh, if it doesn't gel with the vision, or worse, merge it when it doesn't gel with the vision. Like, I mean, both both of those are, are horrible outcomes. Well, vision or context, then it's like, well, whose vision or whose context? Right, exactly. So, as a as a distributed company, uh, and I really learned this the hard way because we didn't do any of this in early circle, and they do this much better in, in late circle after after I left, and I'm sort of like seeing it from the outside. Uh, if you're going to have a distributed team, you need to like be super, super clear on context setting, on goal setting, on directions. You need everyone in your company to be able to like figure out or company project, whatever, to figure out: Are we going in the right direction? Is there even a right direction? What does it mean to be the right direction? What are success criteria, or what are criteria that you will know that it is the right direction, etc. Yeah, I completely agree. I just feel sad about all those people who showed up at work every day and worked hard, and then it's like my my code is not what anybody wanted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, imagine you spend like weeks or months in a thing, and you, you're given no feedback along the way. So like you, you finally show up with like the finished thing, and people are like, "Oh no, that that, that doesn't match the uh, that and even worse, match what we're trying to do." Your manager has thirty four other reports. Mm-hmm. You're like, who's even the arbitrator on this? Mm-hmm. So I think with dark. The reason that we specifically didn't go distributed at the start was that we needed this like extremely high bandwidth communication. 
Yeah. And there's some stuff in distributed systems that isn't well solved, like like whiteboards. Um, yeah, I've seen hacks for it. Yeah. But well, so, that was so. one that we used we used a lot. Like there's a lot of I'm just trying gonna draw this on the whiteboard and, and try to convey to you exactly what's happening here. So part one, why do you think a whiteboard is good? I guess it's so cheap that like you know, they're everywhere and there's a marker in front of you and you can just draw the thing that you mean. And there isn't that in, in any sort of distributed thing. That there are occasionally like Is it for swim diagrams or what do you or is it for what's code a snippet? Swim diagram? Like for a flow between different parts of a system. Uh, I mean, it could it could be for anything. It could be like you're drawing the architecture of your of your system, or it could be just like I'm drawing a quick UI. And I found that when I'm like talking to someone at my desk, I just like pull out a piece of paper and do it on a whiteboard, just as yeah. if I could. But like, it's much harder to do that over over Slack. Yeah, it's impossible to do on Slack. Yeah, and especially if you've got an open plan office, and you're trying to have a phone call with someone. In another place, or trying to have a video call with someone in another place, you now have to like go find a a quiet spot to have that, mm. and all the conference rooms are taken because you have an open office. Like the, there's a lot of problems that are caused by the the overlap of like two cultures, mm. the distributed and the and the co-located. Yeah. So I just got back from a big customer trip to Australia and Europe, mm-hmm. and. Amongst the funniest things was like uh, sometimes they'd have these elaborate video conference setups, mm-hmm. and then they would have like a big sign like uh, "This is not a whiteboard," because <laughs> apparently somebody had tried to write on it. It's not a every sign has a story. Yeah, <laughs> this is not a whiteboard. Mm-hmm. Do not use white. Like it's this very special thing for video conferencing, mm-hmm. and you have to use a different pen. Right. Does it work? I was terrified. I'm not going to touch that thing. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm a vendor, you know, you know, you know, you know, cause damage to five thousand piece of AV equipment. So, so you think you're gonna go distributed? We already are. Mm-hmm. I mean, not distributed. We still have our headquarters in Oakland, but we're hiring more salespeople in the East Coast. We have our customers mm-hmm. there. Yeah, we're gonna put more people in different regions because we have customers there. Mm-hmm. I still think there's a lot of value in having a nexus. If if you're going for a distributed team, then a nexus. Works against that. I don't think we're going for a distributed team. Mm-hmm. We're just trying to go for a. We have people in different parts of the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a distributed team, and a distributed team needs like all the accommodations of a distributed team. When it's easy for someone in the office to do a thing that it's not easy for someone remote to do, like that that starts to breed problems. Oh yeah, it would drive me nuts. Um, I was working at a San Francisco company that got bought by a company in the other re- region. Mm-hmm. And we would do calls and we couldn't understand them. Were they foreign? No, like they were down in um, Texas or Seattle, and the equipment in our office was not that good. Mm-hmm. And the equipment in their office was not that good. And we're like, we can't hear you. Mm-hmm. Like, we literally can't hear you. Mm-hmm. And they would say, oh, we don't care. <laughs> I think I found a bigger problem. Yeah. And they're, they're like, well, you're the satellite office. It's not important for you to hear. And we're like, yeah. Okay, like I guess you're just paying us all to sit here and not understand what you want us to do. Mm-hmm. Like we weren't trying to be cheeky. We're just like we literally cannot understand what is happening on this call. Mm-hmm. Well, Paul, any final thoughts? I, I mean, I, th- I think the major thing is like a distributed team has to be designed for for being distributed and making the transition from one to the other needs a well planned and properly executed plan for like making distributed people part of your team. Thanks for listening to this episode of To Be Continuous, brought to you by Heavybit and hosted by me, Paul Bigger of Dark, and Edith Harbaugh of Launch Darkly. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. While you're there, check out their library, home to great educational talks from other developer company founders and industry leaders. 